Welcome to King of Life Radio. I'm Kenny Hebert, and today we will be in part four on the series we've been in on, on the kingdom of God. Um, and before we get into today's program, I want to do a quick review. Over the last couple of weeks, we have looked at some pictures of the kingdom of God in the Old Testament over the last two weeks. And uh, I want to review some of that before we start to look at the kingdom of God in the New Testament. The first picture of the kingdom in the Old Testament we looked at was the Exodus story where uh, God um, enters the situation where the, the people of Israel enslaved in Egypt and he invades history in those moments and he uh, comes to his people and he uses Moses and leads them out of Egypt, out of slavery, but not just to be let out of slavery uh, to be their own people, but to be God's people and that he would come to dwell with them. And really, it's a picture of the uh, Exodus story points to the, the, the fulfillment of the kingdom in Christ when Jesus comes and he um, sets us free from our slavery uh, to Satan and sin. And, and in doing so, he uh, brings us out to be his people and he comes to dwell in us. And just as in the Exodus story where God um, became their king of the people of Israel, we, as we come to Christ, as Christ sets us free and makes us one of his own, he then becomes our king. The next picture of the kingdom we looked at in the Old Testament was the monarchy of King David and King Solomon, which, which really was a, a picture of uh, the fulfillment of the promise God made to Moses of a good life in the promised land. And with the monarchy of King David, there was a change that was happening here. See, God um, uh, ruled uh, as his as the king of, of the people of Israel, but now God would rule through his representative king that he would establish, that he would choose uh, to be uh, the person representing him on the earth over his people. And King David was the considered the anointed one. He was the first anointed one and uh, a picture of the, the coming anointed one, meaning the Christ, Jesus, who would come. But God made a promise to uh King David, that there would be one of his offspring, one of his sons that would come and would sit on the throne. It would be an everlasting throne and he would rule over uh, God's people and establish God's kingdom on the earth. And after King David uh, uh, dies, uh, King Solomon, his son, um, takes the throne and King Solomon uh, extends the kingdom that that was established uh, through King David, and, it, and he continues to extend the kingdom in, in, in his reign. Um, and in the process, he becomes a his him and his rule becomes a uh, a picture of an expectation of what God's kingdom um, would look like when it came in fullness on the earth. And the the, the reign of King David and Solomon was a, a picture, it was a, a, a really a, a peak uh, experience of the kingdom for Israel. But the thing is, it didn't last, uh, for, uh, last for long. You know, Israel, after King David and King Solomon died, Israel and Judah uh, entered in apostasy and they went into the Babylon, Babylonian exile. And at different times, there was uh, different sons of David uh, that would come. Some would be good kings, some would be evil kings. But what happened was is, is during this uh, time, there was the, the prophets rose up and they would start to warn of judgment and, uh, and, the, and call on God's people to turn back to God. But they would also speak about um, promises that God was making, that God uh, would uh, have a son of David, that, there was, that he would fulfill his promise and that he would um, send one who would come and uh, it would be an everlasting kingdom. And there was different pictures the prophet spoke of, of expectations uh, to expect when the kingdom would come. The prophets Daniel and uh, Isaiah were ones that were spoke of um, a day of the Lord that was coming. And, you know, Jesus quoted often from Isaiah and from da- and Daniel. Is one of the things Daniel talked about, there would be a son of man that would come. And, um, and that, that, terminology of the Son of Man was something Israel expected that there would be one coming, the Son of Man, uh, representing that one that, that came from heaven, who would come and establish God's kingdom. But both, uh, and then you, we see in Jesus' life, he actually called himself the Son of Man. And using that phrase, that terminology, 
the people of Israel would have understood that was referencing Daniel's uh, prophetic promise that spoke of that one that would come from heaven to establish God's kingdom forever. But not only Daniel, there's Isaiah, and these prophets spoke often of a coming kingdom, a coming day of the Lord, a day of judgment, a day of blessing. There was an expectation that these prophets uh, created in the people of Israel, expecting the Messiah to come, the Christ to come, the anointed one who would come, and it would be the day of the Lord, the day of blessing and the day of, of devastating judgment. And it would both happen at the same time. And that God would, would come and he would uh, judge all evil and vanquish all evil and it would be done away with forever and God's kingdom would come in fullness on the earth and there would be a new heavens, a new earth, a new people, a new order, and a new age. And I know people hear that saying new age and think, what are you talking about? God talks about things in ages. There's, there's this current age, this current evil age that we live in right now. At some point, as the prophet spoke, that this evil age would come to a close, and that day when the Messiah would come, it would he would close out this age and it would enter into a new age, an age of the kingdom of God in its fullness. And at the time that Jesus shows up, uh, the people of Israel, the Jewish people, had really developed these expectations, this hope, this longing for the promised Messiah that God had promised them that he, that he would come and with that that they, their expectation was that that the Messiah was going to come and um, do just as Daniel said he would come and he would pulverize and sweep away uh, sinners and all wickedness so here's this expectation of the people of Israel at Jesus time time frame when he, Jesus shows up so they're expecting this 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 uh, Messiah to come and and, and, and just completely destroy and overthrow any wickedness. And as for them, it was really pointing towards uh, the Roman rule that was occupying and oppressing them. But also they expected with that same the same day of the Lord coming with the Messiah, there's expectation of hope of, of the, the, the expectations Isaiah would, would speak of in the fulfillment of, of the kingdom coming where the, the blind would see, the lame would walk, the, the sick would be healed, the, and that the, the captive would be set free. And so there's ex, these expectations that had developed and really were rooted in, in the Old Testament expectations that they've seen happen through Moses, Exodus, the monarchy of David, and Solomon, and then the prophets' promises to them. And so they're looking for, longing for, and guess who shows up? Jesus shows up. And when he shows up, the first thing he says is, he says, the, the kingdom of God is drawn near. And then he starts to heal the sick. He uh, uh, cures the leper. He heals the blind. He, he uh, makes the lame to walk. He raises the dead. Um, and he's bringing the peace of God there proclaiming God's kingdom has come. And he's using the language of Isaiah and Daniel. He's quoting from them. And he's placing these words and these promises in the context of the end of the age. And, 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 uh, and speaking of the promises are, are as he is the promised Messiah. And the people, the Jewish people, they're wondering, who is this? What is happening? Obviously, the kingdom of God is broken in at this moment, they see it happening. What, what was expected for so long was right now happening in their midst. And there were, but there's some things that just didn't make sense to them in regards to the kingdom. But I want to read a couple of passages from Matthew uh, chapter 12, verse 23, just to get a sense of the people as they're seeing Jesus' ministry unfold in front of them. It's Matthew uh, 12, 22, um, 20, and 23. This is the people, and it says, Then a demon oppressed man who was blind and mute was brought to Jesus, and he healed him. So that the man spoke and he saw, and all the people were amazed and said, Can this be the son of David? That was a reference to the promise that God made to David that there would be one of your offspring that would come, that would establish the kingdom forever. And they're wondering, it's just the guy. Is Jesus the one, the promised Messiah, the promised anointed Christ? And then there's also John 7, 31. I want to read for you. And that says here, Yet many people believed in him, in him being Jesus, 
And they said, When the Christ appears, will he do more signs than this man has done? And here, they're, they're, they're both, both passages talk about they're, they're watching Jesus and what he's doing. And he's doing the things must, uh, the, that Isaiah spoke of, the promised Messiah would do, and healing and, and setting people free and these signs. And they're like, he's done all the things that my, Isaiah promised that the, 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 prom, the, the, the promised Messiah would do. But with that, there has uh, that led to other questions. It was you know they they were wondering like okay what about you know what about the promises of the, like like when would the nations be judged when would David's uh, son overthrow Caesar's rule as king and, and had the kingdom really come and so they were wrestling with this because there was an expectation on their part that when the Messiah came. He was going to bring those blessings of healings and, and, and God's shalom, peace, and, and deliverance from their, from their oppressors. But at the same time, this Messiah wasn't overthrowing the oppressing and occupying government. They, they weren't, were, he wasn't overthrowing wickedness and, and pulverizing the, the sinners and the wickedness that was happening all around them. So it was. There was a bit of confusion in their part. There was, and that really is is, is uh, led to this thing. That I'll, I'll use the term mystery. Jesus was was unfolding a new revelation about the kingdom. Yes, he was the Messiah. He was the Christ that was promised. He's the Son of David. And the expectations they had of the Son of David were good and true. But there was more to it that Jesus needed to unfold and and, and show them. And even even John the Baptist himself. One wondered whether Jesus was the one. I want to read from uh, Matthew 11, 1 through 6. And this is when John the Baptist sends messengers to Jesus. John the Baptist is in prison at this point. And, uh, he, and it says, When Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in, the, in their cities. Now when John heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, he sent word by his disciples. And he said to him, are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And Jesus answered him, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have the good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. See, John saw what Jesus was doing. He was fulfilling the parts that Isaiah spoke of, the, the blessings of the kingdom, but he, he wasn't seeing Jesus as the Messiah, the Christ, uh, overthrowing wickedness, overthrowing this, this occupying, oppressing government that was over Israel at this time. And he's wondering, are you the one, or is there, is there another one? I mean, I, I'm willing to put my... He's, here he's in prison for, for preaching the kingdom's coming, and the Messiah was going to come after him, points to Jesus as the one, and then he's wondering... Well, Jesus, you're only doing part. What's the other part? Where's the other part? See, they had the expectation there would be this cataclysmic event where both things would happen at the same time frame where this age would come to a close and a new age would begin. And with that, all wickedness would be destroyed and done away with. And then God's eternal kingdom rule with, 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 with all the joy and blessings that come with God's rule would come in for God's people. And he would dwell with them forever. And this Messiah would be the reigning king. But, but John's questioning that as he sees Jesus. And he's wondering himself. And here's, here's, here's John the Baptist questioning and wondering, why aren't both things happening? This brings us to the point of today's uh, program. It's the mystery of the kingdom. The promises that God had uh, given to the people through the prophets and through the actions in the Old Testament, the picture of the kingdom and the expectations that developed of this closing, you know, the, the, the closing of this age and the start of this next age. Um, and, and that's what was a part of their expectation. But Jesus is showing up and it's not happening at the same time. See, the kingdom's coming. The kingdom had come in Jesus and it was showing up and it was breaking in just as it had done in the Old Testament. But at the same time, this age was not closing out. Wickedness was not completely being vanquished and overthrown. Something has changed. A change, a mystery that Jesus is unfolding 
for them and for us as people. Now, this idea or concept that I'm mentioning about the this current age uh, as compared to the age to come, and you may have, that might be something new you've not really heard uh, before. I know when I first heard this years ago, I, I had read the scriptures and gospels and never even took note of it, but it's something important to understand that Jesus, Jesus himself thought this way, and he taught in terms of the two ages. And I want to give you a couple of scriptures to uh, for you to have as a reference um, that, that shows Jesus thinking and in, in teaching in, the, in these terms. And first one is Mark chapter 10, uh, verse uh, 30. Let me find it here and read that. It says here, and this is actually verse, 30, not, verse 29 of chapter 10 first. And Jesus, this is after Jesus um, is talking to the rich man, and um, the rich man walks away, and, G- and God, and Jesus tells uh, the disciples that nothing's impossible with God, for all things are possible. And Peter responds uh, uh, in verse 28, Peter uh, began to say to him, See, we have left everything and follow you. And Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers, or sister, or mother, or father, or children, or lands, for my sake and for the gospel, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time, or in this age, houses, and brothers, and sisters, and mothers, and children, and lands, with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. Jesus so he saw these two ages, the one that we, he was currently living in as he walked the earth, and the age to come. Uh, and then let's look at, um, let's see, uh, Luke chapter 20, verse 34 through 36. And Jesus said to them, The sons of this age, meaning right now this current age, they marry and are given in marriage. For those who are considered worthy to attain to the to that age, the age to come, and to the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage, for they cannot die any more, because they are equal to angels and are the sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. Because then I want Jesus talks about this age and the coming age, the next age, and he ties this. Notice that he that Jesus ties the, the age to come. Um, entails a resurrection from the dead. That you know, the Jewish people had an expectation there would be a, a time where there would be the, those that have, have died and been buried would be raised from the dead. And so here, Jesus ties the raising of the dead, raising of the dead, to the, the the beginning of the age to come. And then let's look at Matthew chapter twelve, uh, verse thirty-two. And it reads. And whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven either in this age or in the age to come. So here's just three references that show that Jesus had this understanding, just like the Jewish people of these two ages, the age, this current age we live in and the age to come. The Jewish people had an expectation that that the new age or the age to come could not start or would not start until the close of this age is, it was ended. Now let's go last week, uh, to Matthew um, 24, verse 3. In Matthew 24, we're going to actually read verse 1 through 3. And, and then uh, we're going to look actually, actually to uh, Acts chapter 1, verses 3 through 8 also. But here in Matthew 24, it says, Jesus left the temple. It was going away. When his disciples came to the point, came to point out to him the buildings of the temple, but he answered them, You see all these things, do you not? Truly I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And as he, Jesus, sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? This is a reference to what Jesus said, that there would be one stone, not one stone left upon another. And they're associating that with the coming, the close of this age, and and wickedness, and and, um, evil being completely annihilated, destroyed, and pulverized, and, and done with. 
and and the start of the new age. And so here they ask Jesus, like, you know, when is the sign of your coming? So part of that they're expecting he's the Messiah. He's the son of man that's supposed to come, as Daniel talks about, who will pulverize every wicked kingdom and establish God's kingdom. And so they're asking, when, what will be a sign of when, how will you know when, when, you're, gonna, when you're coming in the end of the age? I Meaning, see, they tied the two together. Their understanding was this, this age has got to end. It has to come to a point where this end, age closes out and, uh, and wickedness is ended before the new age starts. And then Acts chapter 1, verse 3 through 8, and it's, um, it's after Jesus' resurrection, and he, it says, He, Jesus, presented himself alive to them, the disciples, after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You have heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be witnesses, be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. See, their expectation, Jesus had come, he had risen from the dead, and part of their understanding of the resurrection from the dead to life eternal meant the beginning of a new age. And so they're asking, so we're going to get the kingdom now, wickedness is going to be destroyed, we're going to be put in power now, and God's kingdom is going to come in fullness, is that going to happen right now? And Jesus says, no, it's not. And see, they were still expecting this close of this current age and the beginning of a new age with God's eternal kingdom. And Jesus is saying, no, it's not going to happen just yet. That's not for you to know. But right now, you're going to receive the Holy Spirit, and you're going to be witnesses to Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria to the end of the earth. So he's saying is, <coughs> and the pouring out of the Spirit was another thing, was a part of the, the age to come and all people pouring it out. And so here Jesus is letting them know that this age has not ended. The kingdom has come. And this Spirit's been given you, and you're, you're going to be one that brings the kingdom to other people, even though this age has not ended yet. So here is this new understanding of the, of the kingdom for the disciples that are following Jesus. See, the Gospels speak of entering the kingdom both today and tomorrow, meaning it's something right now. God breaks in as Jesus shows up there to people and says, the kingdom of God is come near. He tells the disciples, go and preach the kingdom of God has come near and heal. And so here the kingdom uh, is something you can enter into today. But Jesus also speaks, so the gospels also speak, of it being a future event where this end does close and, it, and, and God's kingdom comes in the, in, in the future in its perfection. There's both a future realm and a present realm in which, the, which men and women can experience the blessing of God's king, the blessing of his reign, his, his right to rule right now. It's something we can enter into and something we have as a hope for the future. It's the already and the not yet. However, it's also something to make, take note of this is, is, is there is a clear teaching in, of the New Testament that God's kingdom and his will will not be perfectly or completely realized in this age. While this age is still going on, God's kingdom and its completeness and its fullness will not come. See, central to the biblical, uh, the biblical teaching is, is the doctrine of uh, the second coming of Christ. When God sends Christ to return and when he comes and as God's king, it, it, God's kingdom will come in this Age will come to a close. And the fullness of God's kingdom will come. Even as it says in Revelation chapter 11, verse 15, uh, the second half of that, it says, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. See, it speaks about the second coming. And at that time, all wickedness and evil will be vanquished. Death and sin will will be no more. 
and God will reign forever and ever. The scriptures uh, plainly tell us that human history rests in the hand of God. And it also tells us that it, it looks to a final realization of God's kingdom uh, that will come beyond this current history, beyond this current age. And it'll be a new and different uh, order of existence. It's the promise of the kingdom to come. But yet, while that's true, that there is this day of the Lord that's going to be in the future, that's just breaking in the kingdom, there's a very real real sense in which God has already uh, broken in and, and he's already uh, manifested his reign, his will, and his kingdom in, in the coming of Christ, who is the king. He came in the flesh, and, 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 he, and by him we may experience the life and the blessing of the kingdom right here and now. So we have these two realms, these two manifestations of God's kingdom, his, his rule, his right to rule. See, one in power and glory at Christ's return when he comes back. And also there's one that's present right now because the sun has already appeared and shown up. If there was only a, a single division between these two ages, see, at the, at the return of Christ, our salvation and the kingdom is only a promise of deliverance and the day of judgment sometime in the future. Our redemption is solely just a promise. It's like an insurance policy. But as we, re, as we read and discover in the New Testament, the transition between this age and the age to come will not occur at just a single point. See, right now there's an overlapping of the ages. The age, this current age and the age to come are running parallel to each other right now. So the breaking in of that future kingdom into this present age before this present age is ended and terminated is, is beyond all the prophets' expectations from the Old Testament. See, there, but there's, see, there's, new, there's numerous New Testament scriptures they cause us to come to the conclusion that the blessings of the age to come no longer are something that re- remains exclusively in the future, but have become objects of the present experience in this age. It's something we can taste of and experience right now, breaking in of the kingdom of God. I'm going to read from uh, Hebrews chapter 6, verse 4 and 5. It says, For it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, that's talking about believers, who have tasted of the heavenly gift, the Holy Spirit, and have shared in the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of the age to come. Here it's speaking about tasting of the powers of the age to come. The age to come is something in the future. But we can taste the powers of the age to come right now. Something has happened. See, the king that was promised that belonged just to the future has actually become present in Christ when he came and showed up here. And then he gave it over to the disciples and tells them to continue to preach the kingdom of God is near. See, the powers of the age to come have broken into this age. And while we still live in this evil age, with Satan as the God of this age, we may taste of the coming age. It may not be the full banquet. It may not be its fullness and perfection of the kingdom come, but it's still a taste. Nonetheless, our salvation is not just a promise but an experience right now. And Jesus came in Mark 1, verse 14 and 15. He said, Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God, the good news of God, saying, The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the good news or the gospel. That invite Jesus gave then to believe in the good news of God, that the kingdom of God had come So repent, turn, and believe that God has come and given his life for you. That invite extends for us today. And if you're listening here, that invite is for you. Believe the gospel. The kingdom of God has come in Christ already. As we close out today's program, I just want to give you uh, my website. It's letyourkingdomcome.com. And you can re-listen to this program on that website. Or, or and also um, subscribe to the podcast to uh, hear future programs too. But until next week, uh, you be blessed.